And every hardship is a herald. David, as the man after God's own heart, understood that within the will of God was great suffering and great adversity. Dear Gwitch to the family of God, dear Gwitch, that means God be with you or good morning in Irish right there. You are in the London Irish Centre, don't look so afraid, it's a real language. Dear Gwitch, now we don't quite do it how they do it. In Ireland you say, dear Gwitch, and in return you say, dear Margwitch, which means God and Mary be with you. We don't do none of that as sold out disciples say, dear Gwitch, we say, dear Gwitch. So when I say, dear Gwitch, you better say, dear Gwitch, dear Gwitch. Now you're all Irish and you have to come on the mission team. <laughs> Acts chapter 13. You've just signed up right there. It took a while. You said, dear Gwitch, you got to come now. Acts 13, verse 22. It says in verse 21. Then the people asked for a king. And he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. He testified concerning him. I have found David. Isn't it encouraging when God finds you? I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. What does it mean to be a man after God's own heart? It means to do everything that God desires you to do. The title for today's sermon is A Man After God's Own Heart. The Bible says God searched for a leader that was after his own heart. The word heart in the Greek is cardia. And the Greeks and the Hebrews both understood that the heart was not just that lump of flesh that pumped blood around your body, but it was the seat of emotion, the seat of your wisdom, the seat of your feelings and of your desires and of your passions. So to be a man after God's own heart means to be a man or a woman that pursues God's feelings, God's passions, God's desires, God's mind, God's understanding. God, I want to think like you. I want to work like you. I want to act like you. I want to speak like you. I want to be like you, Jesus. And that's Paul's mindset at the end of his Gospels, at the end of his letters to say, I just want to know Christ. Why? To be like Him. Our Christ-like pursuit of knowledge means nothing if we are not pursuing the heart of God with the intent of doing the heart of God. We're in a scary world where even the religious world is not pursuing the heart of God. Just this week, the producers of the English Standard Version of the Bible, Crossway Ministries, taught this in one of their articles. The article was entitled, The Church Service is Your Main Meal. They wrote this, Your private Individual devotional time or quiet time with the Lord is not meant to be your main source of spiritual nourishment. That's what that worldwide ministry is teaching. These are things taught by demons. We don't come to church to worship. We bring our worship to church. A church after God's own heart is comprised of men and women after God's own heart. There is nothing that can replace your own personal time with Jesus Christ. 1 Samuel 24. David was the man after God's own heart. But this chapter for me stands out in an incredible way of showing just why that is. It says over here in verse 1, After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert of En Gedi. 
So Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. Now this is an incredible scripture. The Bible says here that Saul, after chasing David for hours upon days, upon weeks, upon months through these deserts, just in the moment in the previous chapter as he was getting close to David, God won an incredible victory by starting a Philistine revolt, snatching Saul away from pursuing David and setting David free. One would say that was an incredible victory from God. But as soon as we hit chapter 24, Saul is on the hunt again. What do we learn? Well, sometimes as disciples, we want our previous victories to be permanent victories. It wasn't enough for God to stop Saul in that moment. That devil's coming back. It's not enough to look at our previous victories and desire for them to be permanent victories. Riding on the cult tales of miracles that you did years ago. You're only as good as your last miracle. What are you doing now? I don't care what you did before. Hey, don't worry. God saved you then. Doesn't mean you're saved now. Once saved, not always saved. That's why I've got to lift up Martin and Teresa Scott. That was the best communion speech I've heard in my life. I haven't been alive for that long, so. But it was incredible. Martin and Teresa just 10 years or so ago, gave up their life in Ireland to come and be with God's sold out movement here in London. They have served, built up the church, inspired young men like myself through love and compassion and discipling and shepherding, watching so many come and go, raised up two sons of their own, physical sons of their own. And now the cost Going back to Dublin, I believe is far greater than the cost it ever was for them to leave Dublin and come here to London. And yet they are willing to have present miracles and leave everything they have built in London over these 10 years to come with a small team and go and evangelize all of Ireland. All of Ireland. I am so inspired by what the Holy Spirit is doing through this couple. And did you see Trey and Amelia preaching the words? The devil should be scared, terrified. We are coming for Dublin, and then we're going to Galway, and then we're going to Belfast, and then we're going to Cork, and we're going to get every single county with a sold out church in Ireland. Point number one Does pleasing God please you? Does pleasing God please you? says in verse 3, He came to the sheep pens along the way. This is talking about Saul. A cave was there. And Saul went in to relieve himself. The Bible's a real book. (laughs) Did some stuff. David and his men were far back in the cave. Oh my goodness. The En Gedi is huge. It's this part of the desert where a stream flows through to make this beautiful fertile land. A tropical rainforest right in the middle of the desert. The perfect hiding place for David and his men. And as they went back towards the back of this cave, and bearing in mind David has about 400 men with him. This is a big cave. They shove all the way back, a cave that's usually used for all of the sheep to get put in for the shelter so they can drink some water. Saul has probably got, he's got at least 3,000 men with him standing outside the front of that cave and they just so happen to be in the exact cave that Saul is relieving himself. Coincidence? Not a chance. One might look at that opportunity as David, who has been running from Saul in pursuit of his life, to murder him 
for the fifth, sixth, seventh time, trying to pin him to the wall with a spear. You can understand the emotional distress this young man would have been in. Young man, who's no older than 20 at this point. Let's see what his convictions produce. The men said, this is the day that the Lord had. They were fired up. <laughs> this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Would you not have said the exact same thing? Yes. If I was David, I would have said the same thing. This is the day the Lord has made. And it was. But let's see what David did. It says David crept up unnoticed. Probably because the, all the noise from the soldiers outside. David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went on his way. It certainly seemed like this was the perfect opportunity for the fulfillment of God's promise to David. God had already told David, one day you're going to be the king of Israel. I'm going to raise you up and Saul and his bloodline are going to get taken out and you are going to rule over Israel and Judah. But notice the promise from God in verse 4. I will give you your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. This was a test. God wanted to reveal what David's wish was. In the Hebrew, his pleasure. Not just for David to understand, my heart is gripped to the heart of God, but for the 400 men behind him to see the heart of their leader. Do you compromise your integrity for a blessing? He says, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish or to see what you will do. What has God given you to deal with? What has he given you to see how it will expose your heart? This was the perfect opportunity. God gives you a challenge. How do you deal with it? God gives you a new position at work. How do you deal with it? God gives you a raise. How do you deal with it? God gives you a girlfriend. How do you deal with it? God gives you his son to die on a cross. How do you deal with it? As you wish? Or does what pleases God please you? David was told to do what pleases him, but he chose to do what pleases God. Our life should be all about pleasing God. I've got to lift up Amelia once again. This incredible sister has recently moved to the Wembley household. I went out for a prayer 5 a.m. Saturday morning. And who do I see, as usual, around the stadium at 5 a.m. in the morning? Amelia. But what was she doing the night before? The all-night prayer with the singles. So when the rest of you went to bed to get that physical rest, Amelia went back out to pray. That's a woman that wants to please God. Amen. I love this heart. David wrote in Psalm 15 verse 4 that a righteous man is he who keeps his oath even when it hurts. I think about this moment. And I think as David wrote this psalm, he would have been thinking about this moment. What was his oath? Well, when David was called by Saul to play the harp for him, he wasn't just called to be his musician. But 1 Samuel tells us that he was an armor bearer. These were men sworn to protect the king, even at the expense of their very lives. Little did David know when he made that oath, the expense of his very life would have been about the man he was protecting. 
How seriously do you take your role? David upheld his duty even when his life was at stake. And we can't even uphold our duty when we feel embarrassed to disciple someone. We can't even uphold our duty to God when we don't want to share our faith. Your life is not at stake. We're in the United Kingdom. No one is going to kill you for opening up a Bible. No one is going to kill you for opening up your mouth. And you know this city is just as open as your mouth is. If your mouth is not open, neither will this city be. If your mouth is not open, neither will the hearts of the people that you study with be. What pleases God? Faith. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, It is impossible to please God without faith. Let me ask a question to the church. Do you believe that God answers your prayers? Do you believe that He hears your prayers? I believe this. I can tell you God has been doing miracles. Everywhere I go, I meet Irish people. In my 28 years of life, I have never before ever met so many Irish people. That is not an exaggeration. I have never, I'm Irish. I have never met as many Irish people in my life as I have in the past month. Why? The prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints. I got to say thank you for praying for me, for praying for my wife, for praying for my team, for praying for Dublin, for praying for Ireland. Thank you. And not just this church, but all around the movement, people are praying for Ireland. And that's why everybody that I meet is Irish. It makes me go, Luke, what haven't you been praying for? Your prayers are so, God is so ready to answer your prayers. He is so ready to fulfill those prayers that are deep in your heart. The only prayer that God cannot answer is a prayer that you have not asked. What are you refusing to ask God for? What are you refusing to ask God for? Do you want to know if it pleases God? Evangelism. Why does it please God? Clearly doesn't please the rest of us because we were silent on that point. You know, I'm, I'm married to my incredible wife, Frankie Snow, the beautiful ginger lady in the front there. And she's an amazing wife. She, she, she lifts up my arms. Without Frankie, I would have been in a dark place over this past couple of months because of the great challenges that have God has put on me to refine me as a man of God. My wife has stayed steadfast and faithful. And one of the great ways that my wife shows me love is when I come home and she's done the task that was appointed for me to do. It's my day to cook. I come home, the cooking's already done. It's my day to clean. I come home, the cleaning's already done. It's my turn to get that Finley nappy going and she's already done it. And I get so encouraged. I feel so loved. When she's done the task that I was set out to do, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. How much more so does it encourage the husband of the church when we're doing the task that he set out to do? It fires him up. God is fired up at your evangelism. He's not concerned with their responses. Yes, no, maybe so, it doesn't mean a thing to Jesus. He wants to see your heart. You're the sold out disciple, not the person you're reaching out to. Their response means nothing at all, but it plagues you. We think so much about how people are going to respond that we don't even reach out to them in the first place. You know what kind of evangelism God loves? Every kind of evangelism. Instagram. Bumble, another one that I can't remember the name of. We've had brothers met in such weird places, in apps that I've never seen before. Benga was met on Ubo. Don't use Ubo unless you've had a very good quiet time. 
That's a twisted app. Street evangelism. Train evangelism. Bus evangelism. Work evangelism. Who shares with their workplace? That's why we have no baptisms. Who shares on their campuses? That's why we have no baptisms. Do you want to please God? Because he is pleased when we evangelize. Point number two, God's heart towards leadership. It says, David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. The word conscience stricken in the Hebrew, conscience is nakah, teb is stricken, which means smitten, struck, beat, slay, killed, murdered, scourged or destroyed. His conscience at lifting his hand against the man of God, who was not acting like a man of God, was that his heart felt destroyed. What is the condition of your conscience? What is the condition of your conscience today? How do you feel about the sin that you have committed against God? And how do you feel about the sin that you've committed against the man of God? Let's have a look over here at Exodus chapter 17. Chapter 16, sorry. Got to be men and women after God's own heart. God had a great heart for leadership. It says in verse 1, The whole Israelite community set out from Elim and came to the desert of sin. It's not a good desert to be in. Very dry, which is between Elim and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. About two and a half months. And let's see what they're already doing. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Now, this is a great lesson for both those who are grumbling and those who are leading. Your whole Bible talk is not grumbling against you. It's probably just one individual. Your whole church is not grumbling against you. It's probably just one or two individuals. So stop throwing a pity party and preach the words. You've got to sort out the grumbling. Now the whole community was grumbling against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Who were the Israelites grumbling against? Moses and Aaron. Read your Bibles. It says the whole community grumbled against. Right? The whole community grumbled against. They grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Their grumbling was directed to Moses and Aaron. Verse 6. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening, you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. In the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he heard your grumbling against. Who are we? You're not grumbling against us, but against the They were grumbling against Moses and Aaron, but God took it personal. God took it personal. Grumbling against your leader is grumbling against God. 
You want to see one of the scariest verses in the whole entire Bible? Have a look at Luke chapter 5. Look at the scariest verse in the whole entire Bible. You guys ready? I want to read it with you. It says in verse 22. Oh, baby. Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? God knows your thoughts. He knows your emotions. He knows your attitude. And he can see right through that humble looking smile towards your leader. He can look right through that. Yes, Mr. Evangelist, sir. He can see through your ushering. He can see through your fake song leading. He can see through your terrible quiet time. He can see all of that. And he can hear your grumbling against him. How do you feel towards your leader? How, how do you feel? Now, I know it's not about, about feelings, but Jesus knows them. What do you think towards your leader? You heard of dismissive pride before? That's... that's that's European pride. Let me retranslate it for you. Don't worry. Let me help you guys out. Because I'm, I'm English. So I got it a lot. Let me just help you guys. In case you didn't realize, you are so prideful. Me too. But we're so deceived in Europe to think that we're humble because we're not like those Americans. You know those Americans, right? You know those loud, them loud Americans, right? I, I, and, we're, and we're not like those other nations that only like their nation and stuff. We're not like them. So, of course, we're, we're, not, we're not prideful. Preach, <laughs> that quiet pride. When you say yes, but you mean no. When you say now, but you do it later. When you say amen, that means so be it. You're lying to the Holy Spirit. And God hears our grumbling when he has that dismissive pride. David's conscience was stricken for even a corner of his robe being cut off. And yet you cannot cut corners in building a relationship with your leaders. They love you. You must love them. And you must work to build that relationship. It does not come naturally. Who's fired up about their leader in here? I'm fired up about my leader. I'm fired up about my leader. Now, now let, let this, then that's fine. Let that part of the sermon just drift over your head. Let it go. Go, I'm so grateful for my awesome leader, Dom. I'm so grateful for Paul. I'm so grateful for Michael. I'm so grateful for Frankie, for Michael Harper, Maria. I, oh, I love those guys. I love those guys. But for those of you who were conscience stricken, change. Because you're stopping the movement of God. Have a look at Numbers chapter 12. Verse 1. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife. That's racism in the Bible. Racism in the Bible. Would you be offended if I said the same black jokes that Michael says? If, if I made the, the Adam's rib joke and say, well, black people wouldn't give up their rib. If I, if I said that one. 
Would you be offended? Because if you'd be offended, you're racist. If I can't say those same jokes. If I'm being dead serious, you feel, if you feel some type of way about a white man talking about black sin, about a black man talking about Chinese sin, if you talk about all these different kinds of, if you feel some type of way about that, search your heart. Search your heart. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? It's like, God used me too. Can't I say how we should run this thing? Hasn't he also spoken through us? I mean, I've studied the Bible with people. Why is that guy in charge? I've had a quiet time or two. Why does he get to call the shots? No, I'm one, one of my best friends, he, he coined this term. You know, you've got the remnant who should be honored always. I love the remnant in this church. Martin and Teresa, Michael and Maria, Michael and Michelle, Sean and Sandra, incredible remnant. But then you've got those who act like remnant. And they're, they're young, but they're old. And they also have old opinions. They have old evangelism, old miracles, and old bitterness. I think Moses and Aaron, Miriam and Aaron became spiritually remnant in their hearts. The Lord spoke through us before. God did miracles with us before. So why is he the guy that gets to be in charge? And the Lord heard this. Mm -mm. Now Moses was a very humble man. More humble than anyone else on the face of earth. You know who wrote that? Moses! Yeah. Moses wrote that inspired by the Holy Spirit. And yet you can't take a compliment from God. He believed what God said about him. Even everyone, you said you're humble. No, God said I'm humble. At once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come out to the tent and meet in all of you. So the three of them came out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance of the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. Let's go down. Verse 9. The anger of the Lord burned against them and he left them. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, there stood Miriam. Leprous. Leprous. You notice how Aaron didn't get leprosy? His brothers don't care about their skin too much. But you, you humble a sister by their physical appearance? And you know the church is struggling when the sisters aren't radiant. You know the bitterness and grumbling is evolving inside of you when you're no longer radiant. Far be it from us to let that happen to our sisters. We got to free them from this burden of grumbling and resentment. If you see a sister that has lost her radiance because she's been talking to Jesus, help her out. We're not here to be down and grumble against the grumblers. We're here to lift them out of that pit, to love them out of that pit and to show them there is a better way. Let us not grumble against God. Let's go back to 1 Samuel 24. Point number three here. It's the humility to bow before challenges. Verse 5. After David was conscience stricken. I hope our consciences are doing okay right now. <laughs> For having cut off a corner of his robe, he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. Verse 8. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul and his 3,000 men. 
the boldness of a man after God's own heart. Look at that. There's 3,000 men that would kill him on sight. My Lord, the King. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. David could have responded emotionally in that cave. He was driven away from his wife. He was driven into the desert. He was starved of food. In the Psalms that David wrote during the desert, it says, my, my mouth thirsts for God. My soul longs for God. And through those times, constantly being pursued and having 400 bitter men behind him, telling him, kill that guy. This is our chance. You kill him. He had to go against their emotions and go against his emotions and go with his convictions. He understood the heart of God. That God will honor my righteousness. If I act in a godly way, God will defend me. Was this not the heart of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego? Say, so if we will not bow down to you, God will protect us from the fire. But even if he doesn't, I think this was David, even if Saul kills me, I would rather die than sin against God. He bowed down to his challenge because he understood that every trial is a teacher. Every rival is a rabbi. Every defiance is a discipler. Every problem is a professor. Every adversary is an advisor. And every hardship is a herald. David, as the man after God's own heart, understood that within the will of God was great suffering and great adversity. He understood that the obstacles don't get in his way, but the obstacle is the way. Do you think David would have had the convictions to lead Israel? had he not been hunted for years of his life? Do you not think he would have developed the conditions and the convictions seeing how leadership should not be done? His heart for God was developed in these times. Every person that you thought you were going to be able to baptize straight after your baptism that didn't make it, that is no reason to harden our hearts. Let the adversary be your advisor. The challenges in your life, let them be your advisors. I want to lift up a young man who bowed down to learn from his challenges. Grew up with drugs and alcohol, not knowing God, confused and lost. About a year ago, he went to this festival and had his first encounter with Jesus and thought he had become a Christian and spent a whole year in pursuit of God, much like the Ethiopian eunuch, saving 9,000 pounds of his own money, quitting his job so that he could pursue God, jumping from city to city in search of the truth and goes to this awesome festival called Creation Fest. It's not that awesome because it's not true disciples, but we're getting there. Just a few months ago, Demetri and Miriam in the campus ministry took us out to share our faith in South London. I didn't think it was a good idea. <laughs> I like South London, but there was nobody in South London. But I refused to believe that my God took us there by mistake. So when everyone else was pouting, I decided to go and share my faith. And I saw this old dude said, probably not open, but let me try anyway. Turns out he was a priest dressed like a rock and roll dude and we sat down and he asked me questions about the Bible saying he was weakening in his faith. He didn't know how to do this anymore. He was leading a church for 20 years. He was asking me, Luke, what do you think the Holy Spirit is? And can we still speak in tongues? And can we do all these things? 
I get together with this, this older English gentleman a couple of weeks later and we sit down and he tells me about this awesome festival. He said, Creation Fest. He said, hey, why don't you go and look at their Instagram? So I did. And so I started sharing with everybody who followed Creation Fest. And I shared and I shared and I shared and I shared. And I, and I was so tired of not seeing real men baptized that my Instagram post said something like this. I'm looking for real men from the UK or Ireland who want to grow in masculinity, innovation, charisma, boldness, faith, and character. Are you in? And this one guy called back to me and said, yes, absolutely. I said, great, where are you from? He said, Exeter. I said, no way, my wife is from Exeter. I said, where do you study? He said, Falmouth. I said, no way, my wife studied in Falmouth. And today we've got Matt, who also studied in Falmouth, which is incredible. Which is incredible. That's another sold out Englishman. Michael Green also studied in Falmouth. My wife studied in Falmouth. It's this tiny little university and God brought this man and we did the Word of God study. He was at another festival. So every single day he had to go out into the open field, get rained on and do a Bible study in the rain. Over Zoom, holding his phone and his little New King James Bible and just asking me questions about the gospel. I said, bro, I want to make you into a disciple. But you've got to come and be with me. Otherwise, you're never going to truly see what this is all about. He gets on a train the next day. And he has spent the last week and a half living with the brothers, walking with the brothers, preaching with the brothers, crying with the brothers, praying with the brothers. And our English Irishman named Sean O'Farrell is going to be baptized today as a true disciple of Jesus Christ. I love this man. He's left all of his friends and family. And I'm not going to tell you that it was easy. He struggled. He turned up to a Bible study gray one day. Visibly gray. I knew white guys could turn pink, but I've never seen a gray white man. Gray. He is wrestled. So when you see him making his good confession today, trust me, he means it. He means it. Not only does he mean his good confession, but he means he's willing to be a disciple that goes anywhere, does anything, and gives up everything. So much so that with that 9,000 pounds he has saved, he says, I'm coming with you to Dublin to plant the church. There's two other brothers from the European world sector in two of our incredible churches that have also put their name down to come to Dublin, Ireland. The Holy Spirit had to take a man from a different city and two men from different churches because he wants to save Ireland. Where were the London disciples? Where are the sisters that want to hold up my wife's arms to evangelize all of Ireland? We have spaces. But the reason we don't put our name down for these great Holy Spirit-filled endeavors is because we have not seen our hardship as a herald. We have not seen our problem as a professor. We have not seen our rival as a rabbi. And we've decided to act out of our emotions instead of our convictions. David had absolutely no bitterness towards the guy that was trying to take his life. Why? Because he constantly took his pain to God. David wrote 73 of the 150 Psalms. As he was fleeing from his own son, he wrote Psalms 3. As he was fleeing from persecution from another Benjamite, 
he wrote Psalm 7. As he was delivered from Saul, he wrote Psalm 18. As he was delivered from pretending to be disabled in front of Ashish from Gath, he wrote Psalm 34. As he was confronted by his disciple on his sin, he wrote Psalm 51. As he was betrayed by Doeg the Edomite, he wrote Psalm 52. As the complete strangers tell of his whereabouts to Saul, he wrote Psalm 54. As the Philistines seized him, he wrote Psalm 56. As he flees from David in a cave, he wrote Psalm 57. As Saul sends men to watch David's house in order to kill him, he wrote Psalm 59. In great times of victory, he wrote Psalm 60. In the desert of Judah, he wrote Psalm 63. And another time where he flees from Saul, he wrote Psalm 142. But what I find so incredible about David's worship is even though he was pouring out and dealing with his emotions with God, it was never emotional. A deeper of the studies of the Psalms help you to understand that these Psalms were written with great thought and consideration and structure. A lot of these Psalms are chiastic. That means they're symmetrical. That they go through a train of thought and precisely pinpoint what it is that is on their hearts. David didn't go out to God and verbally diarrhea over God's throne. He sat there and he thought, how can I pour my heart out to God? I'm going to force myself to write two verses of praise. And only for one verse will I tell God my issue. Then in the fourth verse, I will confirm my allegiance. In the fifth verse, I will get out my heart one more time. And in verse sixes and seven, I will confess how great he is. You look through the Psalms and you see this deep structure in every Psalm that David wrote. Not an emotional outpouring of everything that he felt, but a commitment to praise God and learn from his trials. We would be willing to completely expose ourselves as David did. To lay down prostrated before our troubles and say, God, teach me. What is it you want me to learn? One of our deepest pursuits as men and women of God is to keep our hearts soft so that we may see God. This is only done through deep and intense worship. I want to challenge the church. Deal with your heart the way God calls you to deal with your heart. Take it to God and give Him everything you've got so that you can go out and seek and save the lost. Sign your name up to a mission team. It doesn't have to be Dublin. It can be Spain. We can go to Portugal. We can go to Belarus. We can go to Luxembourg and Latvia and Finland and all these different places in Europe. Today is the day that we make a decision to be men and women after God's own heart, pursuing the mind, pursuing the thoughts, pursuing the feelings, the will and the desires and the passions of our God in heaven. I love you and to God be all the glory. Amen.